some of the details. But my, my goal here is to give you a, an understanding of the broad sweep of how things came to be. Uh, and to understand, particularly as we said in page one, that it will be the covenants that will dictate the outcome of these things. The Romans could never have been successful in destroying all of Jewish life. Why? It goes back to what we said on day one. It is the eternal Abrahamic covenant that guarantees the continuity of the Jewish people. Our continuity as a nation is not guaranteed by the United States, <laughs> contrary to what some people might think. Um, we, were, we were doing fine before Mr. Trump got into office, and we'll do fine after Mr. Trump leaves. You see how neutral a statement that was? Okay, I walked a very fine line there. You still have no idea about my political proclivities. Um, but um, the, the strength of the Jewish people is the God of Israel. It's good to have friends in the neighborhood but ultimately, when we recognize that Hashem has made an eternal covenant with the Jewish people, the Abrahamic covenant, we start to see the un... It's, it's kind of the story of Jewish history that is always there, but the historians don't talk about it. And those are the covenant relationships. And so, uh, just forging ahead here, there is a piece for a, a generation or two because of such a, such a massive destruction, uh, there uh, is basically two generations of relative peace. Finally, once again in the year 115, they try for one last, uh, one time additionally before the last revolt. And this is called the Diaspora Revolt. You see it in your notes. 115 to 117, uh, a Roman defeat in Parthia. Uh, is aided by Jewish forces. So he, we see here that Jews were willing to join with other nations in trying to throw off the, the yoke of religious oppression. And so uh, Romans were defeated in, in Parthia. Jews in Cyrene, Egypt, and Cyprus rebel. These were all Roman outposts, all occupied by Romans, but they were also, Cyrene is the north coast of Africa, uh, around Libya, Egypt, Cyprus, uh, which is misspelled in there, I believe. Uh, and uh, Jewish people were willing to take up arms, and initially they were victorious, but eventually Roman reinforcements arrive, the rebellion is crushed, all the Jews on Cyprus are killed, spelling is correct in the overhead, um, and you have the decline of Alexandrian Jewry. Alexandria, once again, is a major city in northern Egypt. It really was the center of Jewish life in Egypt. We had said that for many years, for a thousand years, uh, Judaism had three geographical physical centers. You have Israel here in the middle. In the east, you had Babylon. And down here in northern Egypt, you have Alexandria. Remember that when Joseph and Mary fled, they fled because they were being pursued by Herod the Great, killing all the Jewish boys. They came to Egypt, and most likely to Alexandria. There was a large Jewish community. They probably had mishpucha in, in Alexandria. We, not, we don't have all the details, um, but that's where they went. With this re failed rebellion, there is a decline in Alexandrian uh, a jury. However, the Jewish community in Egypt still remains strong. The Jewish community in Cairo was very well-to-do. They were import-export men. They traded in, in jewelry and rugs and spices. And it was a very well-to-do community. They had big synagogues. They had scholars. There were many scholars. And later on, there were many people in Kabbalah who came out of Egypt. There is a famous repository of Jewish scrolls um, that when the scrolls become worn out, they, they're almost buried in a tomb. And one of those tombs that have been uncovered by historians is in Cairo. And the Cairo Genesia, this, this 
repository of worn out Torah scrolls, as they started to, to sift through the Torah scrolls, they uncovered fragments that were dating back to maybe 500, 300 BC. And as they tried to piece those fragments together, it shed additional light on the text of scripture and on other things important to Jewish history. So Alexandria becomes a, an important area. Uh, the last and final rebellion is in the year 132 AD. Jerusalem at this point had been renamed. And this is the start of the whole name uh, Palestine. Because up until this point, you have these Roman provinces. The Romans arbitrarily divided the land of Israel. Well, not completely arbitrary. Some of the division lines were along the tribal lines. They had Judea, uh, but then they had Samaria, and then they had the Galilee. And so these were the Roman divisions. But because they had seen Jewish people continually rebelling to try to wrest control of Jerusalem, with the destruction of the temple, with the massacre of one million Jewish people, the Romans said, that's it. No more Mr. Nice Guy. We're now going to do everything to erase the history of the Jewish people from the capital of the Jewish people. The Jewish people have only and always had only one capital. The place where God placed his name, Ir HaKodesh, Ir Yerushalayim, the city of Jerusalem. And so the occupying Roman forces understood the power of that, that this is the city of peace, Ir Shalom. This is the city where, of wholeness, of peace, where God ultimately will reign and rule. And so in an attempt to thwart that, they actually say, well, let's change the name. And so they name it after a pagan concept, the city itself, and then they go on further to rename the land. So instead of having Judea and Samaria, they take this little tribe of Philistines, and the Philistines, you see them earlier in the Bible, the Philistines were a seafaring people that have their origin in Greece, okay? The Philistines were basically Hellenized, they were, they were Greeks, but they came to Israel because it was an easy passage across the Mediterranean, and they carved out in different places along the seacoast, particularly in Gaza, in Gaza, in Ashdod, in Ashkelon, and in a couple of other places further north on the coast. There were these Philistine cities. The Romans looked at this. The Romans liked the Philistines because the Philistines didn't like the Jews. And so the Romans said, tell you what, if you Philistines, we know that you're not from here, but we're going to use you just like we use the Herod family. And we're going to name the land after you. So from the way it's pronounced, uh, Philistia, we get Palestine, and we get now a hard P, Palestine. So all through these years, the phrase Palestine was used to refer to a region of land. Palestine by itself never referred to an ethnic group. It never referred to a tribe of people, but rather it referred to a region of land. And the Romans were responsible for renaming it. I have books in my library that were printed in Tel Aviv in 1920, several books printed in the early 1920s, and it shows some of the early uh, towns and villages Many of the early pioneers had purchased scrub land, land that was considered to be worthless. They purchased it at inflated prices. Uh, it was financed by Jewish people in Europe, but this land was legally purchased. And then they found young Jewish people who wanted to come and create a new life, and they were working the land. The photo captions that describe these young people, they are called Palestinians. Why? Because they're living in Palestine. A famous uh, thing going around the internet, every two, two or three years you see it, it makes a resurgence, that in 1939, 
there was a French dictionary that was published early in 1939. And in the center, there were a few pages in color. Uh, if you grew up during the late 50s, early 60s, you know that there were often a little section right in the middle of color photos. Well, in this French dictionary from 1939, one of the sets of, of color glossy pages were illustrations of flags from different countries in color. And one of the countries was known as Palestine. Its flag was a Mugen David. It was a Star of David on a field of blue and white, almost similar to the current Israeli flag. So I think the top was blue, the bottom was white, and there was a Star of David, a Jewish star, in the middle. That was the flag of Palestine. Many of the Arab peoples that you will meet today, if you go and tour Israel, if you were able to do a history, a detailed history of their families, you would discover that a few of them go back generations. They were living in the land. But many more had grandparents or great-grandparents who lived in Syria, who lived in Egypt, who lived in Iraq. And they heard that with the Jewish people building up towns and cities in Israel, there were jobs to be had as laborers. If you were a brick mason, if you could uh, chisel limestone, very important skill, you could actually make a far better living in this Jewish land called Palestine than you could in Iraq or down in Egypt or up in Syria. Large numbers of Arab workmen were attracted to this, no surprise at all, and they got decent jobs and they settled in the villages. After two generations, their descendants saw themselves as indigenous Palestinians, but they're anything but. And just, uh, if you'll allow the excursion here, in 1970, I'm sorry, 1964, the terrorist leader, Yasser Arafat, understood the power of identity. And he basically uh, used this phrase of Palestine to sort of anoint this group of people who would really were not one ethnic group. Uh, the movie Lawrence of Arabia is particularly instructive because it, it lets us understand that the primary identity with many of these Arab folks of Muslim background it, are the clans, certain clans. In Israel, the police are aware that certain Arab clans are involved in certain types of crimes, um, extortion, this, that, or the other thing. By the way, there are Jewish families in the same way. <laughs> there, there's, there's Jewish gangsters in Israel um, that are involved in similar sorts of things. But the clans are the primary identity of these Arab folks. They're, it's also their primary loyalty. And the clans are often grouped around the towns. There was no pan-Arab nationalism. There was no such thing as a Palestinian nationalism. Basically, Yasser Arafat used Soviet money to try to forge this new identity, which the Soviets then could use to oppose the desires of America and the West there in Israel. Long story short, we'll, talk, we'll come back to that in the third week. But there is the, the phrase Palestine originates during this time period. 132, there is a final attempt at rebellion against Rome. A young man is found, and his name is uh, Shimon Bar Kosiva. Uh, you uh, see his name up there, Shimon. He is an individual who is um, uh, very charismatic. He's a young man who is a military man. He is descended from the house of David. He can show Davidic lineage. And there was a rabbi at the time who understood the power of that. Rabbi Akiba becomes very famous in Jewish history. Uh, and Rabbi Akiba is watching this revolt against Rome, and it's not going so well. Uh, rabbi Akiba says, tell you what, God gave me a vision that this young man, Shimon uh, Bar Kosiba, 
is really Moshiach. We're going to rename him, and he's now Simon Bar Kochba. The phrase Kochba comes from the word, the Hebrew word for stars. And if you look at the Numbers 24 passage uh, that is cited there, this, this idea of, and you see it in your notes as well, in your written notes, um, a star shall arise uh, is the prophecy there in the book of Numbers. And it uses the, the, the Hebrew root word for this word of kochba. And so he went from being kosiba to kochba. You just have to change around a couple of uh, letters there. And he was lifted up on a pedestal and proclaimed by Rabbi Akiva to be the new Messiah. Up until this point, the Jewish believers had been involved in the rebellion. They didn't like being under the thumb of Rome. They didn't want their religious practices regulated by Rome, and so they joined the rebellion. I wish there were more evidence for that. I've recently come to, uh, to hear of a number of people who are questioning that, so be aware of that. But still at this point, that seems to be the weight of evidence that the Jewish believers had initially joined this second revolt called by many the Bar, Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Uh, as soon as Bar Kokhba is named as Messiah, the Jewish people who are believers in Jesus, they pull out of the revolt. They cannot fight under the banner of a false Messiah. And it becomes a very significant thing. The Roman, the tide of battle turns when the Jewish believers exit the rebellion. The same thing that happened in Jerusalem in 70 AD. The, Jeru the Jewish believers made a decision, no, we're not going to defend the city. Why? Because Messiah Yeshua said, when you see the city surrounded by armies, flee to the mountains. And as they fled, they were saying, people were calling after them saying, you're going to help to destroy the city. And again, the Hebrew word for destruction is shmad. When you make that into uh, a, a person being a destroyer, you get the phrase in plural, meshumadim, the destroyers. And this is what I was called when I was a brand new believer by Orthodox Jews in my neighborhood. They, when I would, you know, in the, with the enthusiasm and the lack of seichel <laughs> that as a new believer, I would you know, witness to Orthodox Jews all the time. And uh, in, back in those days, it immediately precipitated a loud screaming match. <laughs> so they, they would end the screaming match by stomping off and, and shouting, Meshumad, um, Meshumad, Meshunariam. They would, like in Yiddish, they would warn people in the neighborhood, oh, he's a missionary. No, I was a dental laboratory technician. <laughs> I made crowns and bridges. But they would, so anyone who talked about Jesus was Jewish, uh, was somehow a missionary. And so this phrase becomes now ensconced once the Jewish believers pull out of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, they really, the, the, that action leads to ultimately the great weakening of the Jewish forces. The Jewish forces are eventually overrun. The Bar Kokhba rebellion fails. At this point, the mainstream Jewish community becomes firm in its depiction of Jewish believers as traitors, as Meshumadim. The name now becomes permanent. And so this is something that was precipitated by these two events 2,000 years ago. And yet today, you will still hear this from Orthodox Jewish people. You are Meshumads. You are traitors. You are traitors to your people. So the Romans use the word Palestine to designate Israel. It falls, it becomes very firm. You see there, number four in your outline, another um, tragedy on the 9th of Av, uh, the rebel stronghold, the Bar Kokhba stronghold of Betar, up there in the Galil, falls to the Roman soldiers on the 9th of Av. As a result of the failure of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, Jewish people are barred from Jerusalem and uh, the Romans say, you know, we have to put an end to this once and for all. Again, we're changing the name of the country. We're changing the name of the city. 
no more Jews in Jerusalem, they, don't, they only have forced that for a few years. There really have always been Jews there in Jerusalem. But no Jewish men of fighting age. We can't be threatened in any way. Again, the Sanhedrin at this point, now made up only of Pharisees, because of, remember, the Sadducees were physically connected to the temple. The Sadducees did not survive the destruction of Jerusalem because everything was connected to the temple. They fought to try to keep the Romans out of the temple. They were slaughtered. Only the Pharisees recognized that Judaism could be portable. And so up they slept to Tiberius. And the rabbinical schools that they established in Tiberius are some of those ways of doing things are still there to this day. You can go up in the hills above Tiberius and see the, the kevar, the, the, the graves of some of, those, some of those early leaders. Not from 2,000 years ago, but from four and five and 600 years earlier. So this now brings to Israel a very different sort of, uh, of atmosphere. So there have been just, now this is going to be a review. This is, you don't see this in your notes there. So here, once again, is a review. There are three attempts to reestablish a Jewish kingdom. And you see it here. So there is this one we just were talking about, the first revolt against Rome, 67 to 70 AD. So again, as you take a step back, you're going to see a kind of a panorama that there have been all of these human attempts to enforce Jewish rule on the Holy Land. But in some mysterious way that I'm not going to try to, to, to explain because it's not apparent to us, God has a timetable. God has a calendar. And whatever people do is not going to influence this. So ultimately, the revolt against Rome fails. And of course, one of the reasons for the destruction of the Jewish community um, in Jerusalem was their rejection of the Messiahship of Yeshua. This is what Yeshua said. This is, you're going to see destruction. Not one stone will be left upon another stone. So the, the failure of that revolt was a directly a result of the prophecy by Messiah Yeshua. A second uh, revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt, also fails against Rome there in 132 to 135. Then thinking back to the Maccabees, that revolt also ultimately failed because before long they were bickering and fighting amongst themselves. And one group had to call up the Romans and said, please come and intervene on our side. We'll give you lots of money. Romans came and they stayed and they occupied the land. So it is these remembrances of Jewish days of glory which would then drive subsequent attempts to set up some sort of Jewish kingdom. From this point onward, it was almost impossible to set it up in Israel. And there will now be various attempts in other places to set up a kingdom. But throughout all of this, no matter where the Jewish people were driven, they would constantly think back to Jerusalem. And so they would say, um, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, Psalm 137, may my right hand lose its skill, its ability. May my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember Jerusalem, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. And so that becomes the rallying call for many Jewish people. During this diaspora period, every Passover Seder ends with the words, L'shana haba'a b'yirushalayim. Next year, may we be privileged to celebrate the, the Seder, the Passover, in Jerusalem. And for 1900 years, they said this, and it was like a fantasy. They said it without expecting that it would actually occur. And yet, when God's calendar came into place, God said, I'm going to bring you from the four corners of the earth and restore you to the land. And ultimately, we will see that. Okay, we need to... Uh, stop here, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.